Hello, and welcome to Stage Screen and In Between. I'm Helen. Today I'm at a very exciting event at the Huntington Book Review, and it has to do with the Fonz. Henry Winkler has a new book, the seventh in a series of New York Times best-selling books having to do with Hank in the Here's, Here's Hank series. So we're waiting for him to come on and give his talk, and the name of this book is You Can't Drink a Meatball, through a straw and his co-author is producer writer Lynn Oliver all right well thank you all for coming you two guys Henry Winkler is an actor producer and director and he speaks publicly all over the world <laughs> <laughs> with the Order of the British Empire by the Queen of England, and the jacket he wore as the Fonz hangs in the Smithsonian Museum in Washington. <laughs> Lynn Oliver is a writer and producer of movies, books, and television. She has written more than 25 novels for children and 100 episodes of television. She is the co-founder and executive director of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Welcome authors of Here's Things, You Can't Drink a Meatball Through a Straw, Henry Winkler and Lynn Oliver. Okay. I'm not taking this off. Oh, you can. <laughs> I'm just going to leave a word. Thank you. No, it's okay. I'm not going to touch this again. <laughs> We're happy to be here. We really are. Uh, this is the very first event for our new book tour. Uh, Lynn and I have been working together since 2002. Uh, this is our 33rd novel. Uh, I will just tell you that I am a husband. I'm a father of three, a grandfather of four. We have two dogs, a Labradoodle. Uh, a Labrador and a Poodle ran into each other. Uh, my wife found a little baby Labrador, a little black baby Labrador, brought it home. He was six months old. He grew into a great den. He's 120 pounds. He sleeps on the bed with us, and he doesn't sleep on the bed. He sleeps touching you. By touching you, I mean he sleeps on you like a sick man. You do not get up and pee unless this guy... And now here's another fact about Linus. He has the worst breath in America. <laughs> Linus, I have to go. I woke up in the morning. He seared my eyebrows right off my face. I'm an actor, a producer, a director with Lynn. As I said, we've written 33 novels. I'm in the bottom 3% academically in America. I was bad in English. I cannot spell to this day. Reading is difficult. I was bad at history, at science. I was great at lunch. <laughs> I've wanted to be an actor since I was seven. I don't know how it came into my mind or my body. I just knew that if people were born to do something, I was born to try and be an actor. And I got to live my dream. So this is what I know. To all of the young people in this room, no matter how difficult school might be, no matter how difficult it is to learn, it has nothing to do with how brilliant you are. If you know what you want, you have greatness inside you. And I'm telling you, this is the truth. You have greatness inside you. Your job is to dig that greatness out and give it to the world as a gift. It doesn't matter what it is, because the world needs everything that you do. There was a lull in my acting career. And somebody said, a man by the name of Alan, said, hey, I'll introduce you to a friend of mine. Why don't you write books for children about your learning challenge? I was 31 when I found out that I had dyslexia that I had something with a name, that I wasn't stupid, I wasn't lazy, I was trying to live up, oh, I forgot to, I had short German 
parents, very, very short. <laughs> and they had an affectionate phrase for me growing up. They called me Dumme Hund. For those of you who don't speak German, that means dumb dog. Very supportive people. <laughs> and uh, so I thought I was stupid because they kept calling me names. He said, I'm going to introduce you to Lynn Oliver. She knows everything about writing for children, writing anything, writing everything. When I met Henry over this uh, nasty fish lunch, he described to me what his growing up was like. And, you know, I, like the rest of America, may have assumptions about him. This is a deeply successful actor, writer, producer. Uh, and I thought, well, life has been kind of a dream for him. But when he spoke, he told me how his growing up was so tortured because he was it was marred by the fact that he was never good in school. And there was an expectation of him to be great in school, and he never could fulfill the expectation. And that really touched me. I'm the mother of three children. I'm a, a writer by profession. I'm the mother of three sons, I should say, because that's a special breed of children. <laughs> and uh, well, well, and I never had a learning challenge, and while none of my kids was ever specifically diagnosed with a learning challenge, they are boys. And so boys in school are not necessarily a natural combination. They seem to suffer from temporary deafness when the assignment is given out. I, she didn't say that. that was, she never said that was going to be on the test. Uh, so, I, so my children spent a lot of time in the principal's office. So much time, in fact, that the principal once told me that the chair across from her desk bore the shape of my son Theo's butt. So um, I was interested in what Henry had to say because I think that there are so many kids who grow up not succeeding at school and having that affect their entire personality and their entire self-concept. So I really responded to his story and we hatched right then and there the story of a boy, Hank Zipser, Kevin will tell you the origin of the name, who is smart, funny, resourceful, talented, popular, and just happens to be lousy at school. So Hank, of course, is short for Henry. And Zipser was a woman who lived on the fourth floor of our apartment building in New York City on 78th Street. And her name was Ella Zipser. And I thought it was such a zippy name. <laughs> and Hank was so filled with Zipser personality that we gave him that name, Hank Zipser. He lives in my apartment, he lives in my building, he went to PS87 where I go, uh, where I went, uh, and so he is uh, very much a part of me. We write the emotion truly. I remember what it was to be seven. I remember what it was to study my words, to know them perfectly. I woke up in the morning, I ate my cereal with confidence because I knew my words. When they said, you want to go over them again, my mom said, I said, no, I don't have to. I know my words. I got to class, I took the test. I couldn't remember one word. They must have fallen out on the sidewalk or in the stairwell. I don't know what happened to my words. And that has happened to me all my life. And here it is. I learned to define dyslexia for myself. You spend a third of your time trying to figure out school. You spend a third of your time trying to figure out why you cannot figure it out. And you spend a third of your time trying to cover up your shame and humiliation. And I used you when I was the class clown. But all of a sudden, you got to put pain into these books. Boy, I know how you feel. I actually, my teacher was Miss Adolph. I think she was related. I spent a lot of time like that. But the fact of the matter is that kids write us letters and they say, how did you know me so well? Because we do not write down to the children. But we write comedies first. If Lynn and I don't laugh, it doesn't go in the book. So while you're reading the book, you will find stuff that's funny. While your child is reading the book, they find things that are funny. And that makes us happy. 
So many people ask us how we work together, how we collaborate. Because how do we work together? Uh, <laughs> beautifully. Uh, before I turned to books, I was a television writer, and Henry, of course, you know, his career began in the world of situation comedies. And the way those are written is essentially by a group of people in a room. So the process of collaboration came very easily to us. So there are a lot of things you have to learn to collaborate. You have to learn to listen very well. You have to learn to not snicker at an idea that your partner has. You have to learn to give up some of your ideas in order to come up with something better together. So uh, our writing process begins when Henry comes to my office. Uh, we provide him with ADD kind of toys. Uh, he has a little Zen sandbox that he uses to, to kind of calm down. You know, we, he has toys in the office, balls and marbles and things to roll around. So then uh, we get focus, and then we work together first on the idea. We beat out the idea together. Then uh, I sit down at the computer, and Henry paces around. Uh, sometimes he sits in the rocking chair, which is he's reminded me for the last month needs a new cushion. <laughs> well, oh, man, it's really just... uncomfortable. I <laughs> want to say that in front of you, but it's true. It's all right. I have a, a permanent string on my finger to remember to buy a new cushion, but it fell off this morning. Um, and and we start writing. So he'll have an idea, and I I write it up. I'll have an idea, and he writes it up. We'll both have an idea that bumps into it, one another, and we'll discuss it and work it through. We, um, uh, you know, Lynn, when we're doing this, I just want to say, Lynn always says, I drive her to drink. Then she leaves the computer, goes into the kitchen, and gets a snap. Yeah. <laughs> snap is the beverage of choice. It can, it can solve most problems. <laughs> Particularly get the peach flavored one. So uh, we were just talking, we were interviewed by some kids this morning, and they said, well, what is it you argue over? Because we told them we argue over, over every word. And mostly we argue because Henry never wants to cut anything. Everything that comes out of his mouth, he thinks is just the way it should be. I'm a trained writer. You cut, you cut everything, right? Now there's nothing is ever as good as it, as it should be. And he says, oh, but the rhythm was so great. It's like ping pong. We're fight over the rhythm. I hear a rhythm. I hear an alliteration where a lot of words have the same letters together. Uh, Lynn doesn't exactly hear it, so we try to convince each other uh, that the alliteration should stay <laughs> or go <laughs> or stay. And at the end of this process, at the end of about three months, we find that we've completed a book. So in using this process, we created of the first series that we did, which was for slightly older children, for kids in the third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, Hank Zipser, World's Best Underachiever, we created 17 of those, and then we moved on to our new series, which is called Here's Hank, and that's what we're here to talk to you about today. That came in response, did you kiss that one? <laughs> this book came in response to so many kids writing us and saying, how did you know us so well? We love Hank, we love Hank. And the parents writing and saying, my child is only seven, but they're relating to this book. So we decided that we would write a series designed for kids before they get to third grade. So this is really intended for kids from five to nine who not, who not necessarily have been diagnosed with learning challenges, but who are just finding school a little bit, um, maybe not to their liking, finding school challenging. So those, these books are called Here's Hank. Uh, we've written nine of them. The one that just came out is number seven. You going to read a little from it? All right, maybe I'll set it up a little. So this book is called How to Drink a Meatball Through a Straw. And um, the answer is not very well. So in this story, Hank's family is visited by his cousin Judith, Judith Ann. And she's a very proper young woman and she comes to New York to stay with them for the weekend because she has entered herself in a kids' cooking competition, like Top Chef for Kids. And she comes and she's a very arrogant person, she's very sure of herself, and she is coming, she, she disdains the pizza they're having because she only eats pizza with goat cheese and artichokes. They're eating pepperoni and, and uh, anchovies. So in the, the excerpt that Henry is about to read, 
Judith Ann has gained acceptance to the competition, but one of the people has dropped out at the last minute. One of the kids. One of the kids, and they need somebody to replace the kids. Hey, here's that what you get to do if you win the competition is have a spot on television, and this is very much to his liking. So, without impulsively, as is everything that Hank does, he volunteers. So, Henry. Perhaps I could use you, Chef Smiley said. <gasps> when I first met her, I called her Chef Smelly because I couldn't read her tag. <laughs> use me to do what? I heard you say that you were the king of your kitchen. You were the main god. Hey, you heard that correctly, I said, puffing out my chest. Excellent. You will take the place on Station 6. Because we promised eight contestants. The cook-off is receiving great attention because of our grand prize. Very special. Really? What does that winner get? I asked. The grand prize is a television appearance on country cooking for the city, explained Judith Ann, who was like my cousin, who uh, wanted to sound like Chef Smiley. But you don't have to concern yourself with that, Henry, since I'm going to win. Hey, I've never been on television before. All I have to do is flash a little zipser attitude and boom, I'll have my own TV show. To be honest, I couldn't resist the idea. I'm your guy, I said to Miss Smiley. You can call me Mr. Station Six. But Henry, Judith Ann said, you can't cook. You don't even know how to cook. You have no food. Don't worry, young man, Miss Smiley said. There is already food at station number six. It's quite simple, actually. Artichokes stuffed with crab legs and capers. No problem, I said. Okay, truth time. I had no idea what an artichoke was. I had never heard of capers. And for crab legs, all I was hoping was they weren't going to pinch me. <laughs> Are you ready to participate? Miss Finley said. You bet, I explained. Okay, that was my face and my mouth. But the rest of my body was screaming, Hank, no! What did you get yourself into? Three ways I could get out of this mess by Hank Zipser. One, I could put on big floppy clown shoes and do a crazy clown dance. Wait a minute, I forgot my clown shoes at home. Wait a minute, I don't have clown shoes. Wait a minute, I never did. Two, I could run outside, get a taxi, and ask the driver to take me to the North Pole. Wait a minute, I don't have any money. Wait a minute, I have a nickel stuck to a, a gummy bear at the bottom of my backpack. Three. I could run over to my mom, I could throw my jacket on, grab my lunch bag, and run for it. Wait a minute, my lunch bag. Did you hear what I just said? My lunch bag. Oh my God, yes. That's the answer. What, I, what's in my lunch bag? So the, the letting is, is larger, the words are farther apart, the D's go higher up, and the Q's go farther down. So it makes it much easier to decode. And we're very um, proud and happy about this because it was an expensive acquisition on the part of our publisher. But these are the oh, first books. Also the very first time this font has ever been used in America. So we're really proud of that. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Sir, what is your name? Uh, Greg. Hi, Greg. You did. Yeah. You were on Royal Pains yeah. this summer? You going to watch Royal Pains this summer? Yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay, great. Great. After the Olympics on NBC, I did a show called Better Late Than Never. Better Late Than Never. I just want you to know that. Do you have a question, sir? Okay, so God giveth and God taketh away. So I can't read very well, but I can memorize very quickly and uh, it's like a, a muscle so I would when I auditioned I would read as much as I could I would memorize it as fast as I could I would go in I would do the audition I, what I forgot I would improvise and they would say excuse me you didn't read what was written on the script and I said because I'm giving you the essence of the character <laughs> if I get it I'll do it verbatim <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Hi, my name is Vicky. Vicky, hi, Vic. I have a two-part question. 
Yes. Ryan, I'm not sure. When you look at it, is it the letters are reversed or the words are reversed? You know what? For every child, it's different. Every child, some have it severely, some have a learning challenge that is kind of light. Um, for me, my eyes would get tired. Uh, I would miss words, uh, as Hank does. He would drop words out. We did a novel where um, he goes to the library, reads in the encyclopedia that zombies do not exist. And he left the knot out. So he thinks they're coming to his apartment on Sunday. All I want to do is share my story. And as I share my story, people come and they say, I am, my brother was. Now I understand. I wish I treated my child differently. This is what we did. When we knew that our children had trouble, we said, look, as long as you try as hard as you can, no trouble, no consequence. As I don't care what your grades are. As soon as you don't try, that's when you will have a consequence. I took geometry for four years, same course. I took it in summer school, I took it in regular school, I took it in summer school, I took it in regular school, I took it in summer school, I took it in regular school. That was 1963. I passed with a D minus in my summer school of my senior year. Today, in March 2016, not one person from then to now has ever said the word hypotenuse. <laughs> Said. You know, did I like Fonzie? I love doing Fonzie. I'll tell you something, you know, uh, I made a promise to myself that I would never comb my hair because every actor who ever played a part like that always, always had a comb in the back pocket. <laughs> so I said, I, and then it was written in the script on the very first show of Happy Days to comb your hair. And I said, you know, <laughs> I'm so sorry, I can't comb my hair because I made a promise to myself. And the director went, <laughs> It's written you're going to call me. <laughs> so I walked up to the mirror, and I looked in the mirror, and I pulled out the comb, and I went, Whoa, I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have that in my lifetime, aside from write books, is create an organization, which is called the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators. Are there any SCBWI members here? Yay, hello. So, um, it is a non-profit organization. It's got 25,000 members worldwide. And worldwide, and it consists of people who write and illustrate and edit and publish and agent children's books. So write down, and I'm, I apologize for the name. It couldn't be more awkward if I tried to do it, but I was 21 at the time, and I thought it had a ring to it. What did I know? So it's S-C-B-W-I. SCBWI.org. And if you just even Google writing children's books, it's the first thing that will come up. And that organization is a nonprofit and it will help you find ways to find a publisher or to self publish or to follow whatever path you think your, your book needs to take. Tell the children that I know for sure and Hank knows that they are great. You know, kids don't wake up in the morning and go, wow, I'm going to be like. I'm going to turn my ADD way up today. I'm going to be like a pain in your neck today. They're trying as hard as they can. Our job as adults are to make sure that the child, their self-image plummets because they see other kids. They know they're not doing as well as the other kids. They're not keeping up. They know all on their own. They don't need us to tell them. They need us to tell them a million times a day. You are terrific. You are just fine the way you are. We're going to now sign some books. Uh, Thank you. 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 Thank you.